Hello, welcome back to Scripture Central. I'm Lynn Hilton Wilson, and this is John W. Welch, or Jack, and we are thrilled to be talking about Mosiah. In fact, we're in the beginning of Mosiah, King Benjamin's Sermon. And this is not only a manual of discipleship, but this is probably the best text or big sermon on the atonement that we, has ever been written. Or maybe on any subject. Oh, really? This <laughs> King Benjamin speech is a classic in so many ways, and I'm so excited to be able to just explore a little bit and introduce to people so many ways in which you can really see this with new lenses, with new eyes, with new purposes. Every time you read this book, it rewards richly with new insights. Let's just start talking about the man, shall we? Who is who is King Benjamin? For one thing, he's a king. We know that. And he's a father. He's a good father. Absolutely. He has three sons, and he has taught them. He's a prophet. He's a general. He not only was a general, he also fought. It says he used the sword of Laban. So he's out there on the front lines with his people. He's not standing in the back like Napoleon did. Okay. And he is... Uh, a very successful king. He's been able to unite uh, both Nephites and Mulekites. And Benjamin is also very successful because he's humble. He doesn't try to uh, exert himself to put no. himself above other people. No, very meek. And in doing that, he's actually following Deuteronomy chapter 17, where the law of the king says that the king should not exalt himself above ordinary people. He understands the daily problems of, of family life, the, the plight of the poor. And he talks about how he has been working. He is doing manual labor. But he also has time to be a linguist. He says he knows Egyptian because he's reading the brass plates that were written Egyptian. He knows Reformed Egyptian because he's adding to the text. And he knows Hebrew. Um, and he, then he teaches these languages to his children as well. And he knows the scriptures. Oh, he is a real scriptorian. And what do you make of the fact that he's gone to the trouble of having this speech written out? He says it's because there were so many who came. It says there's so many they can't even count them. And, and so he had to write a lot of copies. And it must have taken some time. They must have planned that in advance. Oh, this is weeks and weeks in planning, especially when you look at the text. There's so many careful parallels and beautiful poetry that help you understand the text that I'm convinced this was very carefully worked through. And because of that, and for many other reasons, I think when we get to read these words, we're not seeing them or hearing them filtered through an editor or an abridger. So we can hear him in so many ways. We also see that this is a setting where they are at the temple. They've brought their tents. They're going to stay for a while. They brought their little booths for the family. Um, to me, it sounds like a Feast of the Tabernacles in the old law because they offer sacrifices. I mean, you look back in the Torah at what was needed for the Feast of the Tabernacles, and you see consistent themes all over Mosiah chapter 1 through 6. Exactly. And the... Uh... The building of the booths and the tents with their doors open towards the temple. So I think those kind of of insights help us to see that there's more going on here than, you might say, just a general conference talk. But the fact that he's building a tower in order for more people to hear, there has been a lot of preparation for this. And what about the insignia? Oh, yes. That's chapter one, isn't it? Let's look at that. So he's giving charge to Mosiah of everything that's going to be needed to be a king. And I'm fascinated that part of that kingship included, he gave him charge concerning the records, which were engraven on the plates of brass and also the plates of Nephi. And um, then he continues on the sword of Laban and the ball or director, which we refer to as the Leahona that led Lehi through the wilderness. Yeah, and when we think of the context uh, of this yes. speech. There have been some really interesting studies of this looking at when were kings crowned. And of course, Benjamin will be crowning his son Mosiah to be the king. Isn't it interesting that in European and in other nations, when you have a king crowned, they will pass symbols. One is the book, which represents the law. 
Okay. Another will be a sword, which represents power. And then there's always an orb or a, a sphere. And that can symbolize a lot of things. Some people think that when an orb is used in a coronation, it represents the uh, plenary power of the king all around the kingdom. Uh, but it may have other uh, meanings as well. And with the uh, Liahona, of course, it's a source of guidance. All these implements are not just there for their uses, but for their symbols as well. But before we get into the sermon, I have one more favorite thing about chapter 1. When he's talking to his sons and giving them counsel, he's asking them to search the scriptures and to learn that they're true. He's, he's, he's really asking them to find their own testimonies of them. And he describes that they are going to be taught the mysteries. Yeah, that word mysteries is a mysterious word. But then what, what do you think those people would have understood by this expectation that Benjamin leads them to believe they will receive mysteries. Yeah, and, and he mentions it a couple of times. It's not only in the narration, but also in his sermon. I think usually the word mystery in the biblical text is this idea that there are things of God that are sacred, that need to be passed on, and that they are divine messages. I assume we can take that biblical definition and put it here. I think so. And here they are at the temple. It's a temple text. And many people, of course, would expect something very unusual. This is not a normal, everyday experience for them. And I think they've come prepared, and their hearts and their minds are open. I think they love King Benjamin, too. Oh, I, yes. And I think when we go to the temple, we go with our hearts filled with love for the Savior. And you're more receptive to hear and, and accept whatever... You're inspired to change or to do or to hear. And things that you hadn't noticed before will come to your attention. And Benjamin promises his people here that their their minds will be enlightened and they will be uh, inspired. And they will then become not just better followers of his son, King Mosiah, the new king, but also of their God. I think he's trying to establish a Zion society, Jack. I think he is really trying hard to have no poor among them. He wants to make a people like the people of Enoch. He wants it to begin with families. Yes. And teaching children these principles. Uh, a Zion community is founded in righteous homes, righteous parents, and then righteous neighborhoods. And you, if you know that your neighbor has a need, you don't turn them away. You, uh, and chapter 4, we'll get to that, but that long, wonderful chapter about uh, uh, what it really means, not just to serve your Heavenly Father, but your, uh, your fellow man as well. And even though there are lots on the family... I feel like this is a time of war. There's probably a lot of widows. There's probably a lot of single women um, or, or single parents. Um, and I feel like because they were in their tents, it's the extended family or the adopted family. It doesn't necessarily mean that everyone had a happy life with children and a married couple. You know, no, this is a, this is a time of people who have been humbled because of the wars that they've been going through. The time of peace is in contrast to what we learn in chapter one of the wars. I think that's right, and well said. The Zion, the nature of the Zion community is, is one where everyone is one, where you have one purpose, one heart, one mind. And King Benjamin's speech is circling around through that process, and we can learn so much. How do you get into a Zion mentality? And... One of the things we encounter right off the bat is not only does Benjamin want them to be humble and to serve, but the, the main point in the first section of this speech is talking about serving. Well, you mentioned this is the first section. Um, as we step out and look at the sermon as a whole, how do you divide up the sermon, Jack? Well, <clears throat> I see seven sections. So let me mention this book called 
King Benjamin's speech, That Ye May Learn Wisdom. It was published in 1998. It's over 600 pages long. Is it available on our archive? It is on the archive. But many people don't know that there's another one called King Benjamin's Speech Made Simple. Is this also on our archive? It is. Yay! (laughs) It just takes out of this book the highlights. And it's in paperback, a friendly, nice use, a useful book. In both of these books, you'll see how we uh, divide the speech of King Benjamin naturally into seven segments. For example... Chapter 2 begins the speech where he calls the people to attention and he goes to a high point there and then he uh, summarizes and comes to a conclusion and then he pauses and he makes an announcement that his son will now be the king. Okay, that's a natural natural section, section. yes. And then you go from that point to the end of chapter 2, so that's section 2. And you get to the end and there's clearly... A, a blessing and a promise that comes at the end of chapter 2, verse 41. So there's that conclusion. And then he shifts in chapter 3, where he switches and now says, I have been visited by an angel. And in this setting, Benjamin is actually functioning as the high priest. Well, chapter 3 is all about the, the atonement. Yes, it is. And it begins with information that this angel has given King Benjamin. And so we have that section and a wonderful conclusion of that section. And then we go on and so on. It breaks naturally. And then section four is the last half of chapter three. And it it focuses on the central point that the natural man is an enemy to God and must put off the natural man and become a saint. And then there's a natural break where the people then ask, is that chapter four? To the beginning of chapter four. Yeah. To apply the atoning blood to them. Yes. And they fall down in a prostration, showing their willingness and their humility. And section five then talks about how we believe in God, believe that he knows all things, believe that he exists, and, and what you must do to be able to believe that way. And then section six talks about how you must not turn away the beggar and how... We help each other. So it switches then to... uh, Care of those who are in need. I think that's the law of consecration right there. I do too. And that's why it comes after you believe in God. Uh, You you then, if you really believe, you'll do what he says. That's all the second half of chapter 4. That's right. And then finally in chapter 5, that begins uh, by them expressing that we have had this mighty change of heart. They want to make a covenant. They feel the Spirit. Please let us make a covenant at this point. I think they've, obviously this has been prepared in advance, and they may even know the words of the covenant, as we do in the temple, that you know the words that you should give in response. And hence they respond in unison. That's right. And then the final seventh section is when he then will confer upon them the, uh, the new name that they are given. And let's remind everyone and remind ourselves, Benjamin's speech is not to be broken up into sections any more than our population should be broken up. He wants the unity to come through all of these gospel principles, a unity of the faith, a unity of life and discipleship. I love what Elder Maxwell calls King Benjamin's speech, and we have a a whole chapter in the beginning of the King Benjamin's speech book. He calls it a manual of discipleship. You've mentioned this already. But this manual of discipleship for me is so important as a Latter-day Saint. I'm living the gospel the best I can. How do I become more holy? How do I be able to retain and remembrance the blessings from the Lord? He tells you how to do it right here in the text. Let's dive in. So, section one is really to tell everyone that we are all indebted to God. And I'm really touched by this emphasis on service. As he says, I've spent all my days serving you, and I want you to serve each other, and you're only serving God. He is a type of Christ. That's exactly what Jesus did. And um, the prophets are to be types of Christ. But 
the idea that we're emphasizing service is exactly what Jesus's ministry was circled around as well. In this section, Benjamin will refer to God as the heavenly king. He also refers to the Lord as the Lord omnipotent. That's exactly right. And he actually uses that word several times in his speech. So watch for that as you're reading along. The, the Lord God omnipotent. Those words are used by King Benjamin and only King Benjamin in the entire Book of Mormon. Another example that we, our authors are separate and our authors are uniquely um, carefully recorded and I, and I think that he's using this word omnipotent to mean God does truly have all power. And just as we are always in his debt, any power that we have is dependent upon God's power and God's resources and what God has given us. And Benjamin starts, I wouldn't say it's theological, but the argument that he's making here is, so personally persuasive. It's, it rings so true that if we try to somehow really count our own talents or achievements or accomplishments or property and say, that's who I am, we're forgetting who we really are. We are sons and daughters of God, and we need to return to him all of our obedience, all of our devotion. He is asking us to serve others, and then we will be in the service of God, as he says. Then what do you think about that word service? That's related to the word servant. Oh, of course, yes. And in ancient languages, they only had one word. Servant and slave, same word. Right. And what is it about a slave? A slave belongs to yes. someone. And we belong to our Lord and our Master. If we want to belong, we need to make a covenant. And this whole text is in preparation to covenant that we will obey him as our Master. I feel like even in my morning prayers, we've got to, I, I like to remind myself, what can I do for you today? Rather than, could you help me? <laughs> you know, I don't want to ever forget who's the master and who's the servant here in my prayers. Why don't we look at verse 21? Halfway down, it says, I say, if you should serve him with all your whole souls, yet ye would be an unprofitable servants. And behold, all that he requires of you is to keep his commandments. And he has promised you that if you would keep his commandments, he ye should prosper in the land. He's quoting Lehi, isn't he? Yes. He knows his script. We well, didn't say he was a scriptorian, but he's a scriptorian. <laughs> you shall prosper in the land, and he doth never vary from that which he hath said. Therefore, if you keep his commandments, he doth bless you and prosper you. And going on, he's even created you and granted you lives for which you're indebted to him. And then this is the point where he says, if... If you do as he commands, he will immediately bless you. And therefore, he hath paid you, and you're still in his debt. And we can never really get out of the debt that we owe our Heavenly Father. And he's written this just in beautiful parallel structures. He's trying so carefully to say, man, I need you to behave um, like a servant of God. This section ends by uh, him saying, And I, even I, whom ye call your king am no better than ye yourselves are, for I am also of the dust. And he says, I want you now to be able to be found blameless. We're going to remove any blame. I brought you together that I might rid my garments of your blood at this period of time so that I can go down having perfectly settled any disputes or any problems and say, I have now told you everything I should. And we saw that in previous prophets as well, in their last will and testaments. And then we start the second section, and it's still in the end of chapter 2. I'm fascinated with the way he defines sin, and he teaches us how, as parents, and as community, and as disciples of Christ, we should stop contentions in our, everywhere in our environment. And how do we do that? So in chapter 2, verse 32, O oh my people, beware, lest there shall arise any contentions among you, and ye list to obey the evil spirit. Now, let's pause for a minute. 
What do you think that means? And ye list to obey the evil spirit. Do not obey? Well, what does that mean? What does the word list mean? I don't know. What does list to obey mean? Well, a ship lists when it leans. Oh. It leans to the wrong side, and you want the ship to be evenly loaded so it doesn't list. Okay. It doesn't mean to listen, but when you list to obey, you are beginning to lean gradually toward the obeying. evil spirit. So don't lean toward the evil or temptation or wickedness or natural man. So I think he's wise enough to know you don't want to go down that way. Even the first leaning toward that will have consequences because it will lead to other things. So that's a powerful little in instruction, I think. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> I say unto you that if you have been taught and you know these things, if you transgress and go contrary to that which has been spoken. You do withdraw yourselves from the Spirit of the Lord, that it may have no place in you to guide you in wisdom's path, that ye may be blessed and prospered and preserved. I say unto you that the man that doeth this, this is the same that cometh out in open rebellion against God. Therefore, he listeth to obey the evil spirit and become an enemy to all righteousness. So he is defining sin right here. If we have been taught and we lean into that which we ought not, we are not just sinning. We are in open rebellion against God, according to verse 37. Well, and here a king is saying, I don't want you to be in rebellion against your heavenly king. Because you know what happens when you're rebellious on earth. Kings don't like that, right? Yeah. The whole thing is a type and shadow. What, what he's talking about here is what we might call conscious sin. But he wants us to be accountable. This whole section of 34, 35, 36 is on accountability. Yeah, that's right. And what he's trying to do is explain that, yes, there is in the law of Moses a provision that says if you commit a sin unwittingly or unknowingly or involuntarily or without planning it. We talked about this a little when we encountered this back with the slaying of Laban. But that's a very narrow exception. If you know what you're doing, even if you list to obey, if you lean toward it, he's saying that's already something that you need to be sure you repent of because it compromises your loyalty, your fidelity. Because this whole text is taking a good people who have made great strides in their community of being unified and becoming a people of peace and a people who love God. And he's trying to motivate them to do better. That's why Elder Maxwell's Manual of Discipleship is so powerful. He's trying to get them to go to the next level. And you can't even lean into wickedness. You have to fully be embraced in the things of God, in serving each other, and in, as he says here, um, 100% involved in no contention and obeying every word out of the mouth of God. It's kind of the preamble to this covenant, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. I think yeah. the way you've That's expressed way that is it, yeah. really clear. And I can see why he would start with these basic fundamental principles, kind of like the Constitution begins with the preambles. Yeah. You, you teach these basic principles. And when you teach a child, you teach these basic principles. And if you teach them, they will not go astray. And, well, and it's not just that they're basic uh, meaning they're not as important. These are profound statements. So let's look at this. He begins by saying, O oh, all ye old men, and also ye young men, and you little children who can understand my words, for I have spoken plainly that you might understand. And he has spoken very plainly and logically. And, and these words and phrases are memorable. They're classic statements. And he's, he's so clear but why have I spoken this? And I pray, I bless you that you should awake to a remembrance of the awful state of those who have fallen into grant transgression. But more than that, I want you to consider on the blessed and happy state of those who keep the commandments of God. And then he says it again. <laughs> For emphasis. And Benjamin likes to double things up. 
For behold, they are blessed in all things. In what? All things. All things. Both temporal and spiritual. And if they hold out faithful to the end, they are received into heaven. And thereby they may dwell with God in a state of never-ending happiness. Oh, remember, remember that these things are true. For the Lord God hath spoken it. It's not the king's words. These are the words of God. And he gives that emphatically and with a testimony. So I want you to obey and serve and love God because of this happy state. And God is trying to help you become more Christ-like. I really love this progression idea of the whole sermon. As soon as we start serving, then we can have charity. And when we have charity, then we are blessed with more power from God. Yeah, yeah. And I love, though, how we're only partway into this speech. We just finished the second section. But he's already pointing us to the end. Okay. And I think in life, we have to keep the end in mind. That we, if we don't keep the final objectives and purpose in mind, we we lose our focus and our orientation. So he's helping us to see and encouraging us. Don't be weary in well-doing. Uh, because we know what it will all end up with, which is good. And I love how he says that you should consider the blessed state both temporally and spiritually. So it's, it's all. And that's, he talks about God's omnipotence, omnipotence, all power, that we might have all blessings in all things. There are not too many sermons that begin, oh, I had an angel tell me about this last night. And in fact, he was so careful about this, he writes this out in beautiful parallels about this angel's visit. So he's taken a lot of care to make sure people can memorize it. I think one of the beauties of parallelisms is easier for memorization. So he says, I would call your attention somewhat more that I have to speak unto you. For behold, I have things to tell you concerning that which is to come. And the things which I will tell you were made known unto me by an angel from God. And he said unto me, awake. And I awoke and he stood before me. That's the center of this chiasmus here. And he said unto me, awake and hear the words which I shall tell thee. For behold, I am come to declare unto you the glad tidings of great joy. So in this third section of King Benjamin's speech, he wants to bear his testimony about Jesus Christ. Maybe this happened, I think, because Benjamin had been working on the talk, and he had done sections one and two, which we've talked about in chapter two, where he is extolling the the virtues and the, the wonder of our heavenly king. And I think as he then ponders and asks the Lord, so what's next? What else should I say? What would you have me say? An angel tells him. And a messenger comes and gives him this new information in more detail about what the Savior will do for us. Well, it's prophetic. He talks about Christ coming in his mortality and his service and the miracles that he's performing. This is chapter 3, verse 5, such as healing the sick, raising the dead, causing the lame to walk, the blind to receive their sight, the deaf to hear, and curing all manner of diseases. And then he goes on in verse 7 to talk about how he has to suffer and bleed And he even says, um, behold, blood cometh from every pore. You know, Jack, I used to not appreciate this, but when I started working in my graduate school with uh, the Jesuits in the Catholic universities, um, they, they took out Luke's account that Christ bled from every pore because there wasn't a second witness. They said, this is just Luke's edition. It probably never happened. Luke wasn't there. This is just his exaggeration. And yet here we have a second witness This is what the angel told Benjamin would happen. Yeah, that's right. And the Book of Mormon is here to help restore plain and precious things that have been lost. This is very plain and very precious. And the angel describes not only Christ's life and death, but he introduces Christ in verse 8 as the Father of heaven and earth. 
and the creator of all things. So if we look at Christ as our father because he created the earth and he created Adam's body from the dust of the earth, then it's easier to see Christ as both the father and the son. Before the name which is at the center of this section, the angel had told Benjamin that Jesus would cast out devils or evil spirits. Right after the name is given, it says that the people will then consider Jesus just a man, and they will say that he has a devil. So there's that interesting bracketing of his holy name. And then, just as at the beginning of this section, the angel will tell Benjamin the works that he will do among men, now we're going to learn what men will do with Christ. And that's when they talk about him being crucified he will and be scourged. scourged. That's ver- the end of verse 9. That's right. Notice that in verse 5, in introducing the coming of the Lord, how he will descend and come down, we have him coming down. Now, after the crucifixion, he will rise and go back up. So is this whole thing chiastic? It is, I think. Okay. okay. And this is the end of... At the end of section three, we have at the beginning, the Lord has heard your prayers and he has judged thy righteousness. That's in verse four. Oh, in verse 10 is he has to do, go through all this to make a righteous judgment. Exactly. And behold, he now stands to judge the world. And behold, all these things are done that a righteous judgment might come upon the children. Because he is the only one who has power to restore that which was lost. So what we're learning here, and we, we mentioned last time how it's important to read this whole speech from beginning to end. And now we're seeing you have to read the sections carefully from beginning to end. Because they're so carefully woven. It's like a tapestry. That's a great way to analyze it. All these little pieces. And when you step back, if you're too close to a tapestry, what happens? You just see the threads. Yeah, you don't see the whole picture. But as you get back, you can begin to see the pattern and you can then see finally the whole, what it's really all about. Well, do you want to move on now to this to the next section, yeah. starting in verse 11? For behold, and his blood atoneth for the sins of those who have fallen in transgression. So this beginning part is also beautifully, again, paralleled in a little chiasmus um, from verses 11 to 16 in chapter 3 that begin our discussion on the atonement, this new section on what does it mean? Yeah. Yeah, this this is the center section of King Benjamin's speech. This is section four of seven. And it is about the atonement. And for one thing, if we do have the Feast of Tabernacles going on here. Which it appears we do. We have a lot of evidence on this The one. Feast of Tabernacles comes right after the Day of Atonement. And so the Day of Atonement would clearly have been on their minds... They do say that they do keep the law of Moses. So they must have had the Day of Atonement where they brought two animals, one on the left hand and one on the right hand. The scapegoat, Leviticus 16. That's right. And they cast out the evil goat. Now Benjamin is giving the essence of the meaning of the atonement. The Day of Atonement is not just a day of general reconciliation with people. I mean, that's part of it. But it is about the power of the atoning blood of Christ and the lamb that has been sacrificed by the people so that they can have a remission of their sins. And we'll see this coming up in this section. I know we've talked about this before, but I like taking that word apart. When Tyndale came up with, what am I going to call kafar in English? At one month this ability for God and man to become at one, that we have this beautiful atoning sacrifice that covers our sins, that redeems us, that saves us. We become at one through Christ's gift. And that's the ultimate unity 
of a Zion community, which, of course, Benjamin is he's now— He's trying to create he, all under one name. Yeah, and so you, you can see, can't you, how, how this is related to what we've talked about in Chapter 2. If you really want the spiritual power to create this kind of obedience and service and recognition of your heavenly king, it has to come in and through the gift and power of the atonement. Which means we have to repent. And he talks about repentance as often as he mentions atoning, sacrifice of our Savior. So now continuing on in through section 4, we encounter verse 11. And here... His blood atones, as we've said, for the sins of those who have fallen. So the first thing that the atonement does is it atones for the sins of all who have fallen. So the fall can be cured by the atonement because it's something we cannot cure. And Jesus knows that. And he will help us in ways that we can't help ourselves. But if we can help ourselves, there we have to act. But he continues on. But he goes on. And in addition... He says, it also atones for those who have died, not knowing the will of God concerning them, or who have ignorantly sinned. So this is picking up a thread that we encountered in chapter 2 at the end of that, where Benjamin is wanting people to know that they are responsible for what they voluntarily do. And we mentioned before that under the law of Moses, if you do something involuntarily, you're not punished for that. But the atonement does cover that, even the involuntary sin. And this is why we have to always be in debt to our Savior. Exactly. He's That's, covered everything that. that we do involuntarily. Um, okay. But then in verse 12, we get our woe. Yes. Woe unto him who knoweth, and he rebelleth against God. For his salvation cometh to none such, except it be through repentance and faith in the Lord. So he continues on with a few verses about uh, why God then has sent holy prophets. And uh, why is this, that uh, God has blessed us or now made us responsible because he has sent prophets? How do you understand this? Well, in verse 13, he says that um, the prophets are also here to teach us of Christ and to repent so that we may receive our remission of sins. What else do you see there? Well, he's talking here about the prophets who are coming because Jesus hasn't come yet. So the prophets are just testifying of a Savior who's coming. And this is 120 years, 124 years before the Messiah will even be born, right? So, yeah. And so he's speaking to his people, letting them know that they can repent and rejoice with exceeding great joy, even as though Jesus had already come. And when you have no time in heaven, you talk as if things happened when they haven't even happened. Exactly. And that's why the prophets come and give the law so that they have signs and wonders and types and shadows. I'm so glad you pointed this one out because the law of Moses, both in Benjamin and Nephi and now here by King Benjamin, they all say we're living it because it's supposed to be a foreshadow of our Savior. Everything is focused. You're not saved by the law. Everything is to point to our Savior. And Benjamin wants his people to know that these types and shadows are interesting, but they don't have the power to exalt. They can help, but as he says, the law of Moses availeth nothing except it were through the atonement of Jesus' blood. It's not saying that the law of Moses doesn't avail anything, but combined with the atoning blood of Christ, all the laws have efficacy, they have value and power. The redemption power of our Savior is more important than anything else. And then we get to talk about his name. Now the name. That's verse 17. So he tells his sons, I want to give them a new name. He tells them when they first start out in the sermon in chapter 2, I want to give you a new name. And now in chapter 3, verse 17, and moreover, I say unto you that there shall be no other name given, nor any other way, nor means whereby salvation can come unto the children of men, only in and through the name of Christ, the Lord omnipotent. Here what he's saying is not only 
uh, Jesus is going to have this name, which has been revealed by the angel, and he's now explaining. But this name is the exclusive way in which salvation can come. Right here at the, the center part of all of his speech, he wants people to know that Jesus is different than the others. And his name is the exclusive name through which salvation can come. Having given us the full understanding of the name of Christ, Benjamin then enables us to respond. How do we respond? And it begins by saying, we will drink damnation to our own souls except. And here is the, the center turning point of all of King Benjamin's speech. Except they, number one, humble, humble themselves. Two, become as little children. Three, believe that salvation is only going to be available through the atoning blood of Christ, the Lord Omnipotent. For the natural man is enemy. an enemy to God and has been from the fall of Adam, and now we turn and will be forever and ever, unless he yields to the enticings of the Holy Spirit. So this parallelism is now coming out as a beautiful little chiasmus, and we're going to repeat as we come out that he put off the natural man. He becometh a saint through the atonement of Christ the Lord and becometh as a child. child that's repeated. Submissive, meek, and humble, right? Like you said in the beginning. And here at the end, we get a little more embellishment. It's not just humble. He wants to be sure he gives us every synonym helped to elaborate what does it really mean to be humble when i say humble i mean patient yes I and mean... submissive and meek and full of love and willing to submit to all things which the lord seeth fit to inflict upon him even as a child doth submit to his father so you just read three units of submission and I love the fact that submit does not mean you're controlled, you're forced to obey. It is has two meanings in the ancient languages, and it can mean a voluntarily willingness to cooperate. And we see here this call. If you want to take upon the name of Christ, if you want to have this name to receive all these great blessings, you will have to voluntarily cooperate to be humble and become as a child, and submit to all things the Father gives us. Yeah. Yes. So when Jesus says, suffer the children to come unto me, do you think he's talking to all of us? No. Oh, if we're humble and meek, I hope so. Well, and we are all the sons and daughters of God. If we come unto him, we even become the children of Christ, and they receive that name there. Benjamin's people are already on the edge of making a covenant. And I can just feel their yearnings and their desires to say, yes, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to enjoy. Why do you think this stands at the center of Benjamin's speech? It is. The, and how central is it? It's the center of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the center of everything on the whole earth. And you know, if you... Uh, Count up the number of words you can do this in, in King Benjamin's King speech okay. and divide by two okay. and then find the, uh, uh, the center word. It's right here in these verses. But it's just the center, 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 the most important part of the ancient languages. We haven't talked about chiasmus yet, but the most important part of a lot of these parallelisms is the center point. Yeah, we are beginning to see how well Benjamin uses and purposefully employs the chiastic structures here. Rhetorically, it's a good way to tell people what you want them to hear and then tell them what they heard. But if you just go one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, they kind of, you know, you don't follow it. But well, I also feel like you, you can go, memorize it easier. Yeah, and if you go like you're climbing up a mountain and you get to the top and then you come back down. It, uh, it I think, psychologically and in terms of learning, like you say, memorizing. But if you're just reading King Benjamin's sermon and the whole Book of Mormon um, beginning to end, a chapter a day, sometimes um, you think, oh, there's a lot of repetition. Oh, this is really redundant. No, 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 there's purpose. There's method to the madness, as Shakespeare would say. That's right. And 
just as the angel had talked previously in chapter 3 about Jesus coming, now he's going to talk about how all people shall come to a knowledge of Christ and of the Savior and how it will not just go to the people that he will know in the flesh, but that it will go throughout every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And thus, no one will be found blameless. So he's now echoing what he's already said. The atonement satisfies what we call an efficient condition. It will save us if we do these things. And it also satisfies what we call a necessary condition. Only if. So it's an if and only if proposition. And we have it here with an echo again of the name of the Lord God omnipotent at the end of verse 21. So you can see how Benjamin is now working his way back through concepts that he's introduced in the early part of the chapter. And he will even, in the next, in verse 23, he says, And now I have spoken the words which the Lord God hath commanded me. Well, when was he commanded to do this? I think this is what the angel told him to do the night before. So what he's doing now is kind of framing this central message about the necessity of putting off the natural man. And we aren't even to making the covenant yet. That's next week. Well, you're certainly right, Lynn, that we're not through with Benjamin's speech yet. We're at the turning point, and it's at a very important place. And this idea that it will be universal, I think that might have been one of the more uh, unusual and informative new novel ideas that Benjamin is giving his people here. And so here we learn that it will be done once For all. So he's had to teach them the gospel and they're learning and they're growing. And now they're to the point where he wants them to enter into the presence of the Lord. They're about to make a covenant with God. And may we apply these messages and teachings of King Benjamin. Um, They are words that our prophet repeats. They are words that the spirit repeats. And they are here in this precious book of scripture for us to become closer to Christ. And may your scripture study be augmented by these wonderful words of King Benjamin. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.